Hey, what's up? I'm Dwayne Ransom for Mr. Flip the Hood. Back at you on another podcast. I'm here with Sadan Long. Again, uh, my business partner, we co-wrote a book together. The Big Picture. The Big Picture. Check us out. You can get it on Amazon. You can get hard copies. We'll even personally deliver you a copy. Just hit us up. But uh, Sadan Long, why don't you introduce yourself? Yo, what's up? This is Sadan Long, most dangerous man in marketing, co-writer of uh, the book called The Big Picture. The number one book for people who don't come from money trying to get money. Um, available on Amazon. Um, you can also, if you're local in the Northwest Indiana, Chicago land area, stop by the Smoke City, stop by Boost Mobile, or um, DM Dwayne, and he might pull up on you. <laughs> in that order, in that order, no right. doubt. So what's up, bro? What's happening with you, man? Oh, man, blessed New Year, man, 2022. Right, right. That's what's up. So, you know, today we'll be talking about black ownership. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, we, we, we both come from a worker background. We worked at Foot Locker together. Exactly. Again, but, you know, now, you know, we, we bosses, you know, in our own right. Uh, not in the sense of being a boss, but in the right of sense of, you know, we don't necessarily answer to nobody. So tell me your experience and what's your thoughts on, you know, black ownership. Well, um, me personally, like you said, we started out you know, in retail together, and, you know, they walked me up out of there, <laughs> you know, and, you know, that was kind of like the first time that I ever thought, like, wow, you could get fired. Right. You know, like, mean to tell me I could do a good job and do everything I'm supposed to do and somebody could feel some kind of way about me and it changed whether or not I could eat. Right. You know, so been fired twice, been laid off, downsized. And the last time I got downsized, my company closed, you know, right before COVID. And it was like, I ain't going through this no more. Right. You're going you, you to be a boss. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Exactly. So, you know, the first thing that I did was like, man, what can I do? What do I do um, that other people want? You know, so I wrote a book. Um, it turned out to be a bestseller. And what I learned from that was like, man. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. You just skipped over that. You said you wrote a book, and it turned about to be a bestseller. What's the name of the book? What's oh, okay. I wrote God Wants You to Dominate. Uh, okay. That was, man, maybe like five years ago now. Okay. It's still available on Amazon, and I became a bestselling author. And That's that was kind of like the first time I realized that, man, all this money I've been making for other people, I can actually make for myself. Right. You know, that, you know, we, we win these awards, and they give you these plaques, and these, pla and these pats on the back. They making money. Right. You getting a pat on the back, you getting a little tin thing that you get to take home and put on the wall, but they get checks. Right. You know, and that was like my first time really understanding that, oh, my work is how they eat. Exactly. So instead of feeding them, I need to feed me and my family. That's what's up. You know, so that's, what, that's, that's what did took you, us off. Did you have any uh, black owners that you looked up to that you like, man, that inspired you to go out and do what you did? Man, the first person I ever really looked at, probably like most of us, was Bob Johnson. You know, because right. I ain't, you know, we ain't really know anybody, you know, locally. For that, those of those that don't know Bob Johnson, break B, it. BT Bob. Okay. okay. So, you know, I grew up in the Rap City era. Right. You know, we used to run home and, you know, see Freestyle Fridays. And, you know, they kept saying he owned BT. So I'm like, wow, the brother owned BT? They don't tape. Right. So then from there, I started really starting to understand that they're, you know, Lester Curl companies and famous Amos, you know, that there were really like national and global brands that black people own. Right, because they'll have you, people will have you believing that we never was bosses before. We never owned anything prior to recent, but we've been owning for the whole rip. I mean, the whole rip, Madam right. C.J. Walker, I mean, you go all the way back. Now, she definitely inspired, you know, again. Madam CJ, elaborate a little bit on who she is. Yeah, I mean, in our community, like you see Lester Curl Company, or you see like a lot of the black owned beauty project, you know, products and stuff like that. But the first one was Madam CJ, you know, so she had the, the pressing comb and she had the different chemicals, you know, to get you that perm. And back I'm not, she was the first black uh, millionaire, if I'm Absolutely. not mistaken. Okay. So again, if you don't know who she is, you definitely. You know, they didn't, but now with the Amazon, they didn't did different things and yeah. showcased her a lot. But, you know, she definitely did her own thing. You know what I'm saying? Before Oprah, there was Madam C.J. Walker. You know what I'm exactly. saying? Obviously, Oprah was the first black billionaire, uh, female billionaire in the United States. But Madam C.J., I don't think there's an Oprah without a Madam C.J. Walker. Absolutely not. I mean, and then, you know, coming up in the hip-hop generation, you know, hip-hop was like, 
something we grew up with. We watched, you know, Def Jam, you know, and Russell Simmons and things like that. You know, it was always kind of like, well, how do I get to it? Right. You do you, so as you talk about that, let's talk about the Jay Z and do you know the story on how they started their own brand? Oh well, here's here's the crazy thing about Jay Z. Um, when him and Dame first got together, they shopped Jay Z all over the place, and they couldn't get a deal. So it was just kind of like, well, what are we gonna do? Because the kid was rhyming fast, and you know he was talking over people's heads, so it wasn't cool. <laughs> it was like, well, we gonna have to put out our own stuff. So you put out your own record, you put out your your little, you know, in the trunk stuff, him, two short guys like that, you know, Master P, you know, so he put it out himself. And then once you got a buzz in the streets, then the record label came back and then he, you know, he linked up with Def Jam and they got a 50-50 deal, which became Rockefeller Records. Right, yeah. exactly. So Rockefeller Records, obviously, you know, he got the Rockefeller clothing. So, it, you know, I did a little research on that and I found out he didn't even want to start his own clothing line. He went to other clothing like, hey, let me represent your, you know what I'm saying, your clothing line, and you pay me and I, as an endorser. And they was like, no, thank you. So he's like, all right. You know, and that was the first step in us realizing our power, you know what I'm saying, to become a, you know, a black ownership, so to speak, because it was like, okay, I'll start my own. Hence, here come Rockefeller clothing line. They built it to a multi hundred million dollar business and was able to sell that. But again, he that that's not what he was looking to do. So he was looking to endorse other brands. But that's what we do, man. I mean, we go get a degree and then we go to all these major companies and it's like, hey, man, I'm the number one in my class as a lawyer. I'm the number one in my class, you know, as a mathematician, you know. Here, take my talent, make money with it. Right, exactly. You know, and give me a check. You know, so that's just what we've been taught. I mean, you go back, you listen to the records, and it's like, you know, he wants to start his own label, never be able. Right. And in our community, you know, and you've seen probably from other podcasts, that, you know, our parents, our, you know, our structure that we grew up in is employee-based. Right. So when you get an education or a talent, we think, oh, you're supposed to take it, you know, to the, to the master. Right. You know, right. and then he's supposed to figure out where he's going to put you. I'm going to put you in construction or I'm going to put you in the field or I'm going to put you in the office. You know, but fortunately, there's enough of us, man, like you and like me and like a lot of other people that we associate with that have been able to start making money on their own who can now give the next generation something to, something to look at and say, oh, okay, I could be like Dwayne Rance for right. I could be like, you know, Saddam Long, or I could be like, you know, a lot of other entrepreneurs that you see now, Eric Thomas, you know, um, Linda Emerson, you know, people like that who are actually in these spaces and owning these companies themselves. Right. You know, because we didn't have like a lot of people close to us. I know you had like William Mitchell, you know, somebody like you knew who actually owned stuff, or, you know, Mr. Copeland, you know, actually owned the company. But you know, it was few and far between. If you wasn't in the right neighborhood, you know, the only guy you knew on some was the drug dealer. Right. But, you know, not, not you know, throwing shade on a drug dealer or glorifying a drug dealer, but a drug dealer actually had his own business. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. He operated, I think, uh, St was it Elon Musk that said, you know, a lot of drug dealers are great CEOs. They just don't know it. But the only opportunity they had to be a CEO was in, unfortunately, in the drug game. But if we had the same opportunities as, you know, other people, we can take those same talents and excel at corporate America and be running Fortune 500 companies, but a lot of, or our own companies, and having a black and brown ownership that a lot of, you know, people, we don't have. So why do you think we lack that ownership and afraid to, to, to st step out there? Well, I think the number one problem that we have in our communities, man, is that we confuse fame and finance. Elaborate on that for me. Okay. We think that because you popular, <laughs> you making money. So what we do is we go chase popularity. And popularity is going to cost you money. You know, it's going to cost you to get, you know, billboards. It's going to cost you to do videos. It's going to cost you to get all of these marketing and, and different little tricky things that you see in the media. Whereas the guys that are trying to make money, they're not flashy. You know, the guys that are making money, 
They in hoodies, they in sneakers, you know, they driving F one fifties. So we looking at the wrong guys. You know, somebody me, you know, personally, I spend most of my time behind the scenes with clients, you know, figuring out how we can attract clients, close deals, and generate profits. So I'm not really concerned about, you know, putting on a three piece suit or making sure my watch is flashy. But yet the people that I'm usually meeting with, man, they pull up fresh to death. And then now we gotta figure out how we're gonna make that money back. Right, exactly. You know? So if you come in the game thinking, I got to buy the car first, I got to get the house first, I got to get the watch, I got to, you know, look like a million bucks, then how you going to recoup? Yeah. Yeah, you, know? you got to come in. That's, that's true. You know, again, I'm coming in doing, you know, everything I'm doing in real estate and different retail locations. None of that was important to me. You know what I'm saying? It was the grind that I put in. Uh, you know, I, I never was, you know, my, you know, T-shirt, shorts, t-shirt, jeans, you know what I'm saying? That's that's my only disguise. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like that's how I wear to work every day. I don't come in trying to impress nobody. And a lot of times we want to impress others. You know, fake it until we make it kind of kind of kind of talk, but that's not really, you know, especially early on as an entrepreneur, that's not really what it's about, right? You know what I'm saying? Cuz you end up working to keep your lifestyle and not grow your business. Right. You know, you end up you get it. You hit a lick. Man, I just got twenty grand. I hit a lick. Now all of a sudden, you got to pay them car notes that you done missed. Now you got to go try to pay down your credit card. Now you got to go try and and get the lifestyle, you know, solidified. When in actuality, you should be reinvesting that money. You know, like one of the things you always talk about is the is the bird method, right? You know, but if you get a house and now it takes ninety days for you to get the money from that house, when you flip it, what you gonna do for the next ninety days? Right. So when you as soon as you get that money, you in the hole. Whereas with you, it's like, man, I'm gonna get this house, I'm gonna rehab it, I'm gonna refinance it, I'm gonna rent it, and then I'm gonna take the equity and move it to the next one. But if you gotta keep funding your lifestyle, you can't move that. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you can't invest in the money because you're too busy investing in the image. Right. Exactly. You know. So I think that's the thing. Like our our image is so important to us. You know. Whereas. You know, you look at the guys who really get money, that's not important to them. It's like, man, I just want to make deals and see this money grow and go home and kick it with my kids. Right. So one of one of my favorite movies is White Man Can't Jump. And in one of the scenes, okay. uh, you know, Wesley Snipes, you know, and Woody Hair. Woody, Woody Harrison. Yeah. Woody Harrison. He come, he tell him, he's like, you know, the thing, the difference about us and you is we rather win first and look good. Second, y'all rather come on the court looking like a million dollars and don't even worry about winning. Y'all rather look good first and win second when we the exact opposite. Why do you think as a culture that is that is so relevant? Why do you think we more concerned about our perception and how we view than actually having a successful business? And why do you think that that be the case? Because that's what we've been taught. I mean, you know, Think about it. When we was kids, what's the first thing they say? Don't you be out here showing out. Right. <laughs> you know, you go to the store. You know, don't be embarrassing me in public. So it has always been a situation where we've been conditioned to think that we got to act a certain way. I mean, you, when you look at our kids, our kids go to school, and if they don't act how they want them to act, then all of a sudden they want to put them in the slow class or they want to label them, you know, difficult. Right, exactly. Okay, so... Um but you could be brilliant. Right. So let's let's talk a little bit about gentrification. What do you, you know, what's your thoughts on that? Like going into, you know, you see it in Chicago, you see it in different communities, how, you know, they'll go in, move us out, promise to give us, bring us back in, but actually come in and re, you know, do these properties and do this and, don't give us the opportunity now. Uh, What's your ooh. thoughts on that? Uh, well, let's let's be clear. Like whether it's Do or Die GI, whether it's Chirac, um, whether it's New Orleans, whether it's um, you know Camden, New Jersey, all of these places, you know, they go through the same thing. They allow crime to run rampant to drive down the property values. So now when you would do a GI, do a die GI or it's Gary Indiana, by the way, um, or your shot rack in Chicago, they running us out of there. So, again, I like to refer back to movies and songs a lot. 
So you remember the scene in Boys in the Hood when they pulled up to the father. He was a real estate agent, broker or whatever. He, he said, let me take you outside. And he broke that down like this is what they're doing. You Gun know? shops, liquor stores. Right. So <laughs> Pawn shops. They do that. They move us out. They let you say the crime go up in our area. They do all of that. They move us out, come back in, take over that area. And it's a, just a constant you know, circle. I mean, what should, how can we stop that? Well, I, I think you can't stop gentrification. I mean, it is what it is. I mean, you can't have houses and buildings that are, you know, 130 years old that you can't, you know, keep standing up. But what we got to do is start understanding how gentrification works and stop giving away the properties. You know, because the <coughs> real key in these gentrification situation is us relinquishing our ownership. But again, a lot of these cases, we don't even own these properties. So they moving us out against, I mean, we, we don't have no option. We used to own the properties. That's the thing. Grandma owned that house, you know. But then when grandma passed, you know, we were like, oh, man, I ain't trying to go live in the hood. So either we don't pay the taxes, then we lose it on the tax sale, or we sell it. But we have to start seeing all of our houses as an opportunity to gain wealth. And if you don't want the wealth, at least sell it to another black man, you know, like you, you like know, LeBron. who can then, you know, make sure that that property stays in our community in some kind of way, shape, or form. Because right. even if you buy the house, man, we know that you're going to give back through programs. We know that you're going to send kids to college. So if I sell my house that grandma used to own that we grew up in that I don't want to come back to, to at least somebody who's socially responsible, I did a good thing. And, and that's what I tell people, right? Support those who support you. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, again, you go into our communities, the black and brown communities, and you don't see a lot of us owning the businesses that's in those communities. But you go to any other community, they own in those businesses. So if we own those businesses and we support each other, obviously that eliminates gentrification because we own this. So you can't move us out of something that we own, uh, you know, we gonna talk about the Black Wall Street on another episode, but yeah, they did. We own the whole community, and they tried to make up something about you know us whistling, and you know they yeah. did that for you know everywhere you go, everywhere you go, we whistled at you know some white woman. some white woman, and they tried to basically demand us to you know hand over the guy, and it, you know, but that's another episode. Right, we gonna talk about you know Black Wall Street because. We, we prove that we can own a community and self-sustain, but again, how do we get back to that black ownership? Well, I think here's, well, here's the first thing that we really have to do, is we have to start making stuff that people actually can use and need. Like you go and you look at the communities different from ours. You know, they have places that only cater to their people. You know, if you're in a Mexican community, you're gonna go, to a Mexican fruit stand and they gonna have everything that you need to make all of their dishes. You know, whereas for us, like where do we go to get stuff to make soul food? You know, we don't have no meat markets or anything like See, that. And that's, and that's <laughs> another thing. We, how do we, you know, I think it's one business at a time, right? right. Like every, every community needs a grocery store, Absolutely. clothing store, everything that that community needs. If we could one business at a time open that and start that i think we'll that'll get back to the black wall street you know what i'm saying because i think we do have that capability absolutely but again starting stuff that we you know we know and we got experience in and just you know taking that leap of faith but you have to make on which camera am i looking at you got to make something for somebody you know you have to make something that people will pay you for like, you can't just say, I'm going to chase my passion. You got to say, okay, what makes money? You know, I remember when we were talking about the Viola deal. Right. You know, so we were talking about Viola and investing. Dwayne was like, okay, well, let's talk about the financials. You know, whereas most people would have just been like, man, I just want to be down. Right. Without never looking at how do I get my money back. You know? So how do you, one of the biggest obstacles we got to come up with is, is, raising, is raising capital. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, it's easy to say start, you know, start a business that people need. But, uh, you know, for instance, a grocery store, it might take one hundred fifty, two hundred thousand dollars to start that. How do we, 
how do we start a two? What we don't have, we can't go to a bank and say, "Hey, could you give me two hundred thousand dollars to start this business?" How do we overcome that obstacle? Uh, you start small. You know, okay. I mean, one of the things we talk about in the book, the big picture. Again, the number one book for people who do not come from money, <laughs> who trying to get money available on Amazon. But you got to start small. You got to start with your side hustles. I mean, like you take me for example. I blew everything, you know, on marketing and radio shows and T-shirts and hoodies. And then I had to start over, you know. But in starting over, I shut all of the kicking it down, you know. So every back, dollar I back got. Back to the sacrifices. Right. You know, no more vacations. I took my first vacation like five years this year. You know? That's what's up. But I'm taking all that money, I'm stacking it, and I'm only making moves that make me more money. So when you get money. Let that car go, because now you can take that car note money and stack it, and then you get another lick, then you put that lick with the licks you're already getting, and your you money go. starts to grow. You know, I teach people, if you can get 200 people to give you $100, I mean, how easy is it to get a person to give you $100? Right, exactly. You see people begging, getting $70,000 a year. So you just got to start small. And if you get 20K, now you can take 20K, your boy got 20K, now y'all can go to a bank with 40K and say, okay... Right. We want to partner with you on a deal. And here's the deal. This is what we've been doing. We're making money. Now we want to expand. As right. opposed to going into the bank saying, I want you to fund my unproven dream. But a lot of times, like now versus 10 years ago, they got different things that you can, you know, crowdfunding. Right. If you, but you got to have a business plan. You got to have, again, you if you see, if you watch, you know, the Shark Tank, don't nobody go on there just be like, I want to start this. They go say, what sales do you have? What exactly. you know? What's your last year sales? What's your business plan? What's your strategy? And then, but again, we want to start a business just by we you know out hanging with our boys. Like, man, I think this is a good idea. We should start this. Ain't did no research. Ain't did nothing. So it's it's levels to it, right? Yeah. Like you said earlier, you know, going in, starting small, then growing. Maybe don't have don't open a a grocery store. You don't have the money to open a but start off by opening a convenience store. You know what I'm saying? With a upfront capital, not as much. And then take that. Don't go buy the nicest car, the chains, the all of that. Save that money. And then, okay, now I got a convenience store. I'm taking that convenience store money, and now I'm putting it into a grocery store. You know what I'm saying? And again, bring in, you know, we got to not be afraid to partner up. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's enough out there for all of us. But a lot of times we so afraid to partner up with somebody thinking we going to be losing something. And my mentality is I gain more by partnering. I don't Absolutely. lose. But again, our mentality is, man, why, why, you know, split a dollar when I can have a whole dollar? I'm like myself, I can make a dollar, but together we can make five dollars. You know what I'm saying? Now I'm split. Now I got 250 versus the dollar. But a lot of times we look at what we losing by partnering, not what we gaining. Our partnering but again do your due diligence you know again i got you know smoke shops i got uh you know gift card stores i got booth stores real estate but none of that just started you know what i'm saying i did due diligence putting in the time research on all of those businesses and not just you know what i'm saying again you got to have a business that's going to outlast your family and friends support because that's go you know what I'm saying? Soon in and what you go do after that. So just continuing to grow that. But again, start small, save your money, grow that business, grow that clientele, get somebody like yourself to market. Cause a lot of people look at marketing like I can't I can't afford to market my business. But the truth of the matter is you can't afford not to market your business. You know what I'm saying? So it's like you're not taking away from your business by taking a thousand or two thousand or whatever to market it. You actually add to your business, but a lot of times it's hard to see that. You know what I'm saying? So go ahead. Well, here's the thing, and, and I'm glad you brought that up. When you first start your business, you got to build it on a solid foundation. You know, we talk about business plans, we talk about business models. You know, before you spend a dime, you need to already know how it's gonna work. You know, before you open a smoke shop, you already need to say, okay, I, I'm in a community where people smoke. 
Okay. I know that they go into these other communities. So if I put my store between them and the community that they normally go to, I just save them 20 minutes. You know, you got to understand, like, okay, I know people come to our community to go to the grocery store. So let me be right around the corner from the grocery store. You know, right. so you have to think strategically, you know, because that's what they do. They figure out we like chicken and then they open chicken spots in our community. Yeah. You know, they know we got to get gas to go to work because of all of the jobs in the suburbs. So they put gas stations in our community. You know, then they realize that we'll wear fake Jordans. So they put fake Jordans in the store. They put white tees in the store. So it's all strategic thinking. But if you take a second and step back and start thinking the same way they think, like, what could I do to make a buck? You know, let me get these $1.99, 24 cases of water on a hot day and go stand outside. You know, now you on one side of the street, your man's on the other side, and y'all making money. But a lot of times it's so hard for us to do that, right? Because it's looking like, man, how is somebody going to look at me? How What's the perception of me? You know what I'm saying? Doing that. Like, you get a business, a lot of times, like, man, anything we do, we like, man, that's ghetto. We doing this, but no, it's a hustle. You know what I'm saying? Like, you go into any of these foreign old owned, you know, stores, convenience stores, they got everything. You can get a t shirt, you can get a steak, yeah, who, you know what yeah, I'm saying? You can get a, 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 you know, a hat, and you can get some pajamas, right. and then you can get a, a, you know, some Roman noodles in that same stove, because they want to make sure if you coming out, they want to be able to supply everything. Right. But we don't look at that. You know what I'm saying? We like, man, well, you don't want to do this. You don't want to mix that. But at the end of the day, it's all about the revenue that you generate and all of that. So we got to break that mentality. I think so much of it is our past mentality of what it looked like or what, you know what I'm saying? Like, well, like, like example, man, like you see, you see me pretty often, you know, getting my run on up the street. So when I first started running, you know, it was like, man, I was embarrassed, you know, cause it's like people were looking at me like, why are you out here? You know, right. like, dude, go to a gym. I'm like, but I, I live in this neighborhood. Why would I go to a gym and I live in this neighborhood? You know, and the thing that I came up with is if you don't work your heart, your heart don't work. You know, I'm not out here because I want people to like me. I'm out here because I need to be physically fit. I'm out here because I'm not trying to die from diabetes. I'm out here because I'm not trying to die from heart failure. So we need to have that same approach when we start talking about business. Like, okay, I'm doing it this way because this makes money. Now, what yeah. you're doing don't make money. You know, yeah, you spent all your money, you got this boutique, and you ain't got no customers. Yeah, right. yeah, I only got this little kiosk that I only run during Christmas, but I made money with this little kiosk. And then when Christmas over, there ain't no customers, I'm gone. Right, exactly. You know, I don't have to pay rent every month like you do. Right. And, a, and, and a lot of times I'm like, test kind of your business strategy Absolutely. in different things. You know, whether, you know, if you if you cooking, you know, offer weekend plates or whatever, you know, you, you know, you can do to start that. You know, they got different flea markets that you can take a small business idea, test the waters, mm -hmm. and see, you know, if your business idea can work for the masses versus just saying, you know what, I got this idea, I'm going to open up a storefront, and I'm going to get going. Because that might not necessarily work for the masses. Yeah, your family, your kids, your cur you know, your close family might like your cooking, but the masses might think that it ain't the greatest idea. And a lot of times, what I've experienced is people take their passion and think that they can always turn their passion into a business. Just because you can cook don't mean you can open a restaurant. That's two totally different things, right? You know, um, yeah, because you got to run the restaurant. <laughs> right, exactly. And it's going to be more about running a restaurant and less about cooking right. because you, it's a business now, right? And a lot of us just not even look at that. You know what I'm saying? And just, again, I think if we do more as business owners, pull our resources together and partner together more, I personally think that that's the key to, you know, to black and brown ownership. We're pulling our resources together. I said, eventually, I want to start a hood shark tank. You Absolutely. know what I'm saying? Where I have the opportunity of people come to me with their business. Don't come to me with, you know, something you you came up with last night, right. but something that you did research. You know what I'm saying? And me and a couple other people can, you know, bring our resources together and support that business. Because I think 
a lot of us have those great business ideas, but we just don't know how to fund them, how to get the resources to, to get them started. You know what I'm saying? I think that's what's hurting our community uh, as well. Well, here's the thing, man, that most of us are still early stage entrepreneurs. You know, like we're not second, third generation entrepreneurs. We're right. first facts, facts. On, year, you know, we first, first five years, yeah. first generation. So for us, you know, our our plan has to be to stay in business, you know, because, right. you know, like I know there's got to be ebbs and flows. Right. You know, so it's like, how do I stay in business long enough to become experienced, long enough to get predictable? You know, because right. you go back to, to Foot Locker, you know, one cool thing about Foot Locker that business was it became predictable. That they made us look what we did last year. <laughs> and <laughs> and actually that's what we go on right now. Like right. the goal is just to be last month, right? right? If you can be last month and keep growing your business, that's that's key. But again, that's the mentality that Foot Locker brought in, you know, you know, put installed in me because they said, How do you do this? You know, different things that you can do. Cause a lot of times we don't know what to do when our business struggle. Right. So the easiest thing to do is just shut down. Right. right. But do you got a mentor? Is it somebody you can go to in that business and say, hey, what do you, how do you become successful in this business? Do your, again, I can't overemphasize enough going out, doing your due diligence, talking to business owners. Anything I start, that's what I do. I go on, I go talk to different business owners in that field and learn as much as I can before I start any venture. Absolutely. And a lot of time we'd be afraid or we think that person ain't gonna give up the knowledge and you'll be surprised on the people that'll just say, hey, this is how you do it. This is what you do. But here's, any, for anybody watching right now, anybody that's getting money who knows how to get money, they wanna tell people. They do, man, I wanna, <laughs> I wanna share as much knowledge as I possibly can but I don't, you know, again, like you say, I don't like to waste my time, though. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because people will come to you every day. How do you do this? And with no intentions on actually doing it, just, you know, making conversation. There ain't nothing wrong with making conversation right. But at some point, I want my conversation to be productive and help you out and turn, you know what I'm saying, and get you going on. But if, if, but if you're watching right now, you really got to ask yourself, okay, if a guy who's getting millions of dollars gives me some free game, why wouldn't I take it? Right. Why wouldn't I apply? Why wouldn't I use it? You know, because this person's already made all the mistakes. You know, so and that's, and that's priceless. Exactly. You know, I mean, I can remember being in the supermarket one time and ran into a girl I went to high school with and she was telling me her situation. And I was like, okay, go back tomorrow and tell them this. You know, two days later I hit her up. So how'd it go? She's like, well I ain't get a raise, but they gave me a five hundred dollar bonus. You know, why? Because I've been through the situation and I knew that she was doing great work and they couldn't lose her. So right. as soon as she said, well, I don't think I can continue to do it at this price, they was going to have to say either we got to let her walk and find somebody else or we got to give her some money. So they gave her the money. Right. You know, but if you haven't been in those situations to where somebody can coach you through it, can give you what to look for, can give you how to see it in a way that the bosses see it, then it's hard for you to understand that. You know, because if you're talking to a kid who never been a boss, you like, okay, well, as the bosses, this is how we think. Right. So how do you get in? How do you get in touch? How do you think you reach out to the to the bosses and say you want to go open a you know a clothing store? What would you recommend you do? Like, I would recommend that you partner with somebody who's not doing business that's in a good location. I mean, I always recommend that you find somebody who's got to pay rent and not able to meet their demand and then you partner with them because if you can drive traffic to their store for your line of clothing then they have an opportunity to then try to sell some of their stuff as well you know like example if you come into smoke city where we are right now on east chicago avenue you might see two or three things that you need but then there might be that third thing that i sell that we could put in here so we all could get some money so now when I'm promoting on social media, I'm wearing my T-shirts, I'm going live, and I'm telling people where my stuff is at, I'm also telling them where your stuff is at. Right. You know? Or like even back in the day when we were promoting comedy, you know, we go back to the Crystal Palace days. You know, man, we was driving money into that place. Yeah. You know, we got two, 300 people in a place that was empty. 
Right. You know, so they got liquor. They got people coming back other days to to either go to an event or have a few drinks with a friend, all because we were there. Now, if we move, we take our crowd with us. Right. And now they're not making money no more. Right. So, like, and that's a great idea. And that's a, we we got to probably touch on that. The, the 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 successes and the failures of the Jackie promoted. Yeah. yeah <laughs> uh, uh, of the different entrepreneurs. Uh, adventure, you know, that we, we started. But again, like you said, the business is starting the business going up. I know a popular thing now is pop up shops. Right. You know what I'm saying? So as a, you know, black and brown owner, you know what I'm saying? Again, do I recommend those pop up shops, right? You mm-hmm. can go into a location, take your idea, mm-hmm. like they say, pop up somewhere, take your idea, you know, see what type of, you know, feedback you get. So is that something, you know, you, Here's What's your the, thoughts on that? Here's the trick to pop-ups. The trick to pop-up is getting the list of people who spent money with you. Okay, Because what you want to be able to do with your pop-up is have a list of people that you know going to come out every time so that you could do pre-orders. So, like, say you cook it. You know, if I do barbecue or something like that, you know, 500 people come out, kick it with me over the course of a year. Now, I got 500 people that I could send a text to for my next pop-up. Then I could say, hey, check it out. If you bring two people with you, I give you something for free. So now they just turned 500 people into 1,000, maybe 1,300 people. So the key is to make sure that you get your customer list. Because as you get your customer list, now you can move from one event to the next and know that you got people coming. Right. And you could track who came and who didn't. And then when you start really figuring out who the people that really rock with you are is the term called net promoter. Net promoters are people that really rock with you. They'll post your stuff. They'll go live. They'll check in. You know, they'll recommend it to other people. So when you start knowing who those people are, then now you got some people that you can then make friends with. You know, like, hey, man, can you make sure you share the post? Because you know we're going to be at so-and-so, so-and-so. So now I got free marketing. Right. You know? Exactly. So you got to get that list. I mean, whatever your pop-up is, if you do cupcakes, get the list. Then you can start, you know, maybe getting birthdays or things like that and take that one customer and get four or five sales out of it. You bought a cupcake for me, but now I made you a birthday cake. I done got you some cupcakes for your kids' um, birthday. I done got you something to take to work. Because when you're a new business owner, the hardest thing to do is get customers. Customers. (laughs) Right. So, again, like you say, the hardest thing to do is get customers. Um, I got multiple retail locations. One thing that I did for my uh, one of my boot stores, uh, shout out to Boots Mobile. Um, but one thing I did when I first started was my marketing strategy was going in every event within that community, being involved in every event. If they had a festival, if they had um, a parade, if they, you know, different cities have different picnics and I was at everything, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Give away key chains. And again, what I was doing was I was signing people up on the VIP list. What was the VIP list? I offer something for, you know, you, you come into my store. And you will be surprised. You will gain customers, continuous, faithful, loyal customers just by offering them some type of loyalty program. You know what I'm saying? And you will go to these different events within the community and sign people up. And now they come in faithfully to you and they'll travel distance just to come to you based on the fact that you offer something. So get your don't sit within those four walls of that that store. You know what I'm saying? If the business is not coming in, you got to go out and get the business. Anything that's happening in the community, anything collecting that data, sending out text messages, to the customers on the data you collected. Again, working in Foot Locker, they, you know, as the training, the easiest people to get to come back to your store is satisfied people that's already been to your store. Exactly. We call you them lifers. Exactly. So you get them, you support, I mean, you reach out to the people that came to your establishment. Because a lot of times people be like, man, everybody know McDonald's. Why, why they do so much advertising? Everybody know McDonald's. Right. So when you think of something quick to eat, you go on to McDonald's, right? So it's back to that out of sight, out of mind, right? You can have the best, if you're a restaurant, the best steak, the best this, but if nobody remembers or think about it, what good is that product? You got to constantly be in people's face and, again, market to the people that's already in your business. That's going to create the loyal customers, the lifers to 
create the black businesses, the black and brown businesses, to grow that business in the community. And again, you know, uh, back where where my uh, Boost Mobile story is, it's actually, I have five businesses within one building that I own. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I maximize every inch of that space. I got, you know, a smoke shop, I got a barber shop, beauty shop, you know, the Boost Mobile, real estate office, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, gift card store, all within those businesses. And it's maximizing every inch of that space. And again, that allows me to go out those resources. And again, another thing that I say, anybody uh, that's starting a business, minimize any overhead that you do not need. Exactly. Don't have a car note if you can't move in with your mother, with your sister, with a brother. Anybody to minimize all your overhead because, again, as your business grow, you can't have a lot of that extra stuff. You know, again, you said you just took your first vacation in five years as an owner. I, I It used to, you know, I'm looking at some of my employees that I, you know, I like to think I play very well. They taking vacations. They going out. They buying new things. And when I first started my business, I wasn't able to do that. So they like, you work too hard. You need to, you know, take a vacation. And I'm thinking to myself, I want a vacation. I just can't afford a vacation right, right. now. But as time go on, now, you know what I'm saying? I can I can change the, the weather anytime <laughs> I want to by hopping on a plane and going somewhere hot. You know, we got a, a, a winter storm coming today, but, you know. Might go somewhere warm I might tomorrow. go somewhere warm tomorrow. I got that luxury financially and freedom-wise. You know what I'm saying? So, But like you said in a, in a previous podcast, you said it's like a baby. Right. You know, but just like a baby, the baby don't come into the earth walking and talking. Right. You know, the baby had to, to learn. First, learn how to talk, learn how to walk. Somebody had to hold their their hands and why their legs got strong. And the same thing with a build a business. You know, you got to get to the point where I have consistent customer base, where I'm getting a good return on my investment. And that stuff don't come year one. I mean, year one, man, you're probably gonna lose money. So if you yeah. can't afford to lose money, you probably shouldn't go into business. And, you know? and and again, you you a lot of people look at businesses, and one mistake I made. A lot of people look at businesses like, yeah, it costs X amount of dollars to open a business. And you you might get all of your research on saying how much it costs to open a business. And that number is 100% accurate. But what we what they don't tell you is, okay, what now that I open a business, what it costs to maintain a business and I ain't got no revenue coming in. And that's a mistake that a lot of us make, right? We just right. say it costs 20000 to open this business. But... Employees got to get paid. You ain't got no revenue. You got to have something. That's why I say as an owner, you need to minimize any overhead that you have. Mama, father, parents. Oh, hey, can I move in with you for the next two years? And again, it's sacrifices. Because it's going to be two things. When you're not making money, it's going to be easy for you to walk away from it. Right. You know, statistically, I know most businesses fail within a year. And in the first three years, it's like a 90% failure rate. You know what I'm saying? Right. And that's because a lot of people don't understand all of everything that go into opening a business and maintaining it until you get to that revenue generate uh, place where you actually send some money, especially if you look at, you know, I quit this job to start a business. Now you go from Fifty thousand dollars a year, or a hundred thousand dollars a year, to no thousand dollars a <laughs> right. year. But let's let's take let's even go beyond that. Now you're looking at now I'm actually in debt because I can't do everything myself. So I got payroll to meet, and I ain't gen generating that uh, revenue. So again, we really might have great ideas, great great business plans, and all of that. But those factors that we don't consider going into that you know, to ownership, we, we, we lose out and miss out on. Well, but, you know, again, you know, you know, any entrepreneur watching that's really been in business for a while, they'll tell you that, you know, we come in the game believing that people are going to support us. You know, but what they don't understand about support is that support has a time limit, number one. You know, you don't expect to go to somebody's wedding, give them a gift to help them get off to a good start, and then have to come back next year and give them another gift. You know, right. so support only lasts a few months. I mean, if I went to your restaurant two or three times, I feel like I did my part. 
You know, and then the other thing about support, it got a it got a price. You know, I mean, somebody might support you, you know, five, twenty, thirty, forty dollars, but when you start having larger ticket items, it's harder to support you. You know, like I always laugh at my mama. You know, my mama likes to support black businesses until there's something that she really care about. Then it's like, well, I don't know. I mean, that's five thousand dollars. So now, you know, that it starts to wane. You know, because if I'm going to get this guy $20,000 to fix my roof or give this black guy who just started $20,000 to fix my roof, now the risk in that is is got me thinking, well, maybe I should look at the other guy. You know, right. So you have to really start to build up your foundation with people, like you say, going to the events so that you're not just a business owner to them. You tuss. Right. You know, you're not just a business owner to them. You the guy that was at our basketball game. You the guy that coached our little league team. So that people see you as human because you build up trust. And that's really what marketing is about. Like, how do I say things to get people comfortable enough to trust me and be interested enough to figure out whether or not we could be a good fit to do business? Right. And again, like you say, we go back on the marketing as a you know business owner. I think it's, you have to, without question, have a marketing budget right. every month that says X amount of dollars regardless is going into marketing. Don't look at how much it's costing you because again, you take those marketing dollars as long as you using those marketing dollars effectively. Cause a lot of times we throw money out there and it's not effective marketing. Uh, but you know, you know, keywords, Google search, stuff like that is good. You know, good marketing and you know, uh, social media, especially again, understanding the demographics of your audience on who you trying to, uh, advertise to and market to that that's that's key too because you can be advertising to a demographic that has absolutely no interest in the product that you sell it exactly. so yeah you throwing marketing dollars out there but it's ineffective because it's not going towards your your target audience so right. understanding and knowing your target audience so you can get that product in front of them I think is key to you know having a successful business and to you know, uh, you know, black ownership. Exactly. Definitely. I agree. Well, one more thing to help to that. Like there, there are people who make marketing materials. And I think this is kind of like something that we confused on, especially in our community. There are people who make marketing materials and there are people who use marketing to make money. Like when somebody asked me, you know, am I a marketer? I'm like, no, actually I'm a revenue generator who uses marketing who uses copywriting, who uses exactly. psychological selling, who uses sales funnel, who uses free traffic, paid traffic to attract customers, close deals, and generate profits. Right. But if you think that the person who makes websites and who makes flyers is going to give you a marketing plan, most of the time they're not equipped to do that. Right, exactly. And, you know, again, going back, is marketing important? If you look at all of the professional athletes, all of them get paid based on the marketing that these big companies can do based on TV deals with, you know, the TNT, the NBA, you know, yeah. the ESPN. When they they get paid, the NBA get paid mostly off of whatever marketing, I mean, whatever TV deal, you know, uh, NFL, you know, the... the, the, the you yeah, know, exactly. And the guys that are the hottest... right. Get free Red zones, <laughs> right? So now, get paid what, so explain that marketing. So now you got the, you know, the red zone. So they pay a hundred million dollars, uh, you know, for. Okay. So let's 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 take in athletics for example. You know, you look at say a TNT. Now TNT knows that these kind of people watch sports. They know that men between the age of eighteen and 55 watch sports. So, okay, now we need to put some, some Ford commercials on that. So we go to Ford and we say, well, Ford, if we're trying to sell some cars, you need to put it during the NBA game. You know, we know that those people drink sodas. Which sodas do they drink? Oh, they drink Sprite. Oh, okay, well, cool. Now we're going to go to Sprite. We're going to go to Pepsi. We're going to go to all them and see who want to give us the most money to get at this customer base that we have. Right. So a TNT, a goal, and pay $2 billion to the NBA for the rights of X amount of games. Right. They then take those games and advertise to the Fords, to the Pepsis, to the whoever they got. So that's how they to recoup, recoup that they, money. Exactly. So that's how you understand the importance of marketing. Why, you know, why 
30 years ago, the same athletes wasn't getting paid what they because they didn't have these TV deals. Right. You know what I'm saying? They didn't have all of these. Te- they didn't televise a NBA game. It was just on tape you know, delay. It was. It was. You like, probably not old enough to remember on tape delay. No, I do. But a lot of times it wasn't even. You know, tape delayed. It was just never advertised. You know, all Bulls games in the early 80s wasn't advertised. Right. You know what I'm saying? Some games came on air, but now they realize that's what a true money. Yeah, you can make whatever money from when they come to the stadium off of all of that revenue, but that's only limited to the space of that. But when you look at advertising to, you know, 20, 30 million people or whoever, or whatever your audience is, that's where the revenue come in. Exactly. So, again, the Facebook marketing, that's a good way. And you can target Facebook on Facebook marketing. You can target, you can be so detailed on your target audience that if you know what you're doing, you, it, you're not spending a whole lot of money. Exactly. You can have a minimum budget of four, $500 a month, but it's effective because it's actually targeting your target audience. And I think, again, that is key to grow on your business. Um, well, it's understanding your customer. I mean, you want, you want a person to give you money, but if they don't feel like you care about them, why would they give you that money? Right. And the right. key way to show that you love, respect, and understand someone is by showing that you understand. understand someone. Right, exactly. You know, so like, I know what you're going through. Here's a way to not have to go through it. Right. You know, like you do real estate. You know, I know it's hard to find a good place to stay in some of these neighborhoods, but I got houses, you know, that we've redone the bathrooms, we've redone the kitchens. we And make them desirable. Right? Exactly. So, so that's what's up. But, again, Snot, I want to thank you for yeah, coming coming on to the show. Uh, let us know what we can, you know, because I'm sure people going to want to know how they can get in contact with you if they got any marketing questions or, you know, want to hire you for your service. What can they get in contact okay. you with you Let's see. You can go to go. You can go to grownandrich.com, and you can contact me there. You can also find me on social media. I'm Sadon Long. That's S A D O N L O N G. Um, you can also go to Amazon, put my name in, and you'll find that God wants you to dominate is there. Um, you also find that the big picture that I wrote with Dwayne Ransom is there. Um, if you stay tuned, you'll see some other stuff I got coming out later on this year. I got a sex and health book coming out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sex and health book. Okay. So stay tuned for that. And I got a book coming out in April with CEO Corey Elliott, a C- CMT roofing called Pivot. So follow me on social media. Um, I usually go live at least once a week answering people's questions. So if you have questions, um, how to attract customers, how to close deals, how to generate profits, where to start, um, feel free, you know, hit me on any of my inboxes and DMs. And man, I'll answer your question live. If you don't want me to say your name, I won't say your name. Um, and also, you know, if you need to know how to start a business from scratch with little or no money down, make sure you cop the big picture. Available on Amazon. I mean, again, like I said before, you know, if a guy who's getting millions of dollars is willing to give you some game for nineteen ninety nine, why wouldn't you take it? Right. And it's funny, you said Jay Z, and I think I can't remember the song. He said, "You know, I'm trying to give you the game for nine ninety nine. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like he really trying to give you game." So if you pay attention, you don't have to go out and spend all that money on it uh, for that game. Again, you can get books and, you know, do your research, and uh, it, it's definitely out there. But, again, Sadan, thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks for coming on the podcast. Anytime. Uh, again, my, I'm Dwayne Ransifer, uh, Mr. Flip the Hood, uh, Flipping the Hood. Uh, that came from the real estate. But thanks for tuning in. Uh, see you next episode. Mom.